we can find, regardless. We might be lucky. As we were just um, leaving that sighting or trying to reposition, before the rain had started, VM said, it's only halfway through the drive, a lot can happen in one and a half hours. And I thought to myself, ah, that's just a very pessimistic take on things. It's winter, it's not going to rain now. Well, here we are. <laughs> Marvellous. It does seem that we have rain covers that are so deeply unwaterproof that it astounds me that they can be called rain covers at all. I think we'll have to rectify that situation a little bit later, somehow. Gaffer tape and bungee cords is what this company is built on. <laughs> there we go, Vim's already making a plan. <laughs> You can't see what I'm talking about, of course, everybody. The rain covers to my side are basically just flapping w uselessly in the wind. We'll be able to fix them a little bit later. Unfortunately, we're driving straight into the weather. All right, Steve, I don't know what he's man or how he's escaped the weather, but he's still with Hosanna. Let's go back to him. Yes, we have. We've been moving with him. He's sniffing the air. We've covered everything we need to cover. Just a very soft, light pattering of rain falling down. But if it does increase, we will rush back. Go get our roof on. But at the moment, Seb, you happy? At the moment? The important things are covered, which is good. Very soft, gentle rain. Very out-of-season rain once again. He's going to come walk right up to the car. No, Asteria, he doesn't. Sorry about that, Seb. He doesn't care too much about the rain. It actually, probably is quite nice for him. The wind, though, is gone. The wind that brought in this weather has completely disappeared. Uh, sorry that he's walking behind the car, folks. There's not a lot I can do about that. <laughs> he's definitely got some interest in, in something in the thickets towards the left here. Blake, yeah, I would say that, I mean, we've been with him for some time and he's been interested this entire time. So I'd say most certainly, probably the longest I've been with a leopard in active sort of stalk mode. Which is quite marvellous. And he's still, I mean, he's obviously very hungry. You can see by the way he's moving. I don't know what he's spotted. I think he's got more of a smell than he has of any visual of an animal. Sorry about that. Sorry about the, the screen, folks. We just got a few, few droplets that flew in from the side. Oh, there was a beautiful butterfly that almost landed on his nose. Just listening to the sounds of the wilderness. Carol, with it raining, I don't know if it'll improve his chances. Um, the wind would have helped a lot, but the wind has dissipated, so any movements he now makes will be given away. Um, and also, when it's windy, it, it's quite frightening for the animals because it gives, it sort of masks his movement. Everything that twists and moves and flickers is potential danger. So animals get quite unnerved in these conditions, but he's walking very deliberately there. I don't think, as I said, he's seen anything. He's got his nose to the ground. Maybe, ooh, there's a yawn. Maybe he's smelling a dacre or a steenbok.
and it does get quite thick in that vegetation there but we are going to try and stay with him as the rain seems to have completely gone away <laughs> Jamie you're talking about when dogs are wet they do smell a lot stronger when they're wet I think it's a different smell not necessarily that it's stronger it's just it's a sort of a more sort of saturated I mean to me there's nothing quite like the smell of a wet dog she has been on the beach and then decides to jump on your face always quite funny okay Seb we're gonna try get through here he's going back around to the road I apologize for my eye, eye contact folks but we do have some dense vegetation to try and scratch through and while we do that let's go over to James who's nicely covered I am nicely covered it smells like summer here with this falling rain we're just gonna see pop our heads down into the area where we think she is again I, I, like I say I can't do very little off-road driving with this roof on so we'll just look down to where she was we have had a great view of her today already so we won't worry too much if we don't see her again the little track that heads in here down towards the milkberry I've gone too far then but have a groan yes see be lucky might not be lucky don't know we'll be lucky I think I've come too far I've definitely come too whoops the daisies definitely come slightly too far along let's we'll stick our heads off over here and have a look Another leopard orchid, says Vim. <laughs> Do you see any leopards in there? I don't see any leopards in there. You might just be able to hear the soft pitter-patter of rain. Yeah, let's go back. There is a squirrel. You see the squirrel, Vim? Let's observe the squirrel briefly. There it is. Oh, what a fantastic sighting. It's gone now. It ran across the bottom of the frame. It was awesome. Sorry you missed it. It was truly fantastic. The temptation when you make the mistake and stall the vehicle by letting the clutch up too quickly, the temptation to then rev the engine as though the engine has been at fault in some way is almost overwhelming. Now Steve, I'm afraid, has got caught in more showers, so he's going to have to come put a roof on. Can't see behind us, so we're reversing by sound. Now this morning, when we, were, when we started out with Tandy, the cub was nowhere to be seen, but we could hear squirrels alarming probably about 30 meters away. So Sarah, I don't think the cub would willfully go too much further than, I'm going to say 100 meters or so, 300 feet. I don't think she'd go much further than that. And that's not to say, of course, that she couldn't be much further than that, because if Tundi left her to go hunting, then obviously she would be. But I think of her own accord, if Tundi was around, I don't think she'd go much more than 300 feet at this stage. That will change as she gets a little bit older. Alrighty. I'm not really sure how I missed the little track going down. I think I was probably complaining about the weather or something. It's in here, isn't it, Vian? Vian's sitting in stony silence. Oh, there's the there's the milkberry. Let's try it on here. See if we don't get lucky down this way.
Do you see any leopards, Vim? You can see about 10 degrees. Yes. What does it mean? Not an easy one. There's the milkberry. So this is around about where they were. Here's the old den site. Oh, and yet another giant log. Yes. Sucks to you, log. Break. So this is where I thought we'd just stick our heads because this is where we lost them last, they were in here. That gully, that gully where they disappeared is just in here. But I'm afraid everybody, I don't think that our Tundi sighting is going to continue today. I do apologize. Still, we had a good morning with her. We saw Tlalamba. I took a few illegal photographs, which was quite nice. No alarm calling. So I think we'll probably just press on. Shall we press on then? We'll do one loop around Ingwe Alley, which is the road up the other side. And then go somewhere else. Mysteria, a comment from you. Holy macaroni, James, you are mowing the logs down. Well, yes, I am. I'm mowing the logs down. Trying not to mow all the living trees, but certainly the dead ones have taken copping a horrible beating. Well, I can hear a brew brew shrike calling. not hear the incessant drivel. There are actually three kudu here. You see them, Vim? Mm -hmm. May even be more than that. And thank you for all your suggestions as to how to overcome my very bad temper. Now, Kirsten, can we have a few of them? We have the Snickers bar, we have more coffee, we have uh, sleep. Shamsun, a back rub. That would be wonderful, Shamsun. I'll take you up on that. We'll have a back rub. Thank you. What else? I think you'll find that the calming effects of the wilderness will now slowly start to work their magic on me, and I will be able to calm myself down. YouTube, <laughs> you say, a <laughs> The timeout corner. I probably would be sent there if it wasn't for the fact that we're the only ones that can be live right now. Let's go back to the kudus. Young male and two females. He's probably related to them. I don't think he's quite old enough yet to be consorting with them in the manner that might produce more kudus, if you know what I mean. Nudge, nudge, wink, wink. And I think they're in this thick bush precisely for the same reason that we have a roof on our car. They don't like the rain. Naturally, of course, the rain has now stopped. But I'm not going to complain about that. Look how quietly and peacefully they are scraping the ticks off their bodies. Oh, going to sleep. Wonderful. Could you don't do this normally, you know? They're normally not nearly this relaxed. Azira, you would like me to be your guide when you come out on safari. Azira, are you sure about that? I mean, if you are, if you're, if you're sure, if you're brave enough to take my foul temper, well, then I, you know. Uh, you think there's money better spent? You think there's money? says he thinks your money would be better spent elsewhere. Elsewhere, <laughs> perhaps with David. Agreed. That is really a stunning kudu sighting, everybody. I'm not just being facetious about this, it really is spectacular.
Almighty, Nikki, you've obviously heard, in, heard us speaking about Nyala, Impala and Kudu and you want to know what the differences are. Well, the biggest and most obvious difference is that the Kudu there is a 270 kilogram animal at full, at, when it's fully grown, so it is much, much larger than a male Impala. A male Impala is only 60 kilos or so, so about, you know, it's 200 kilos heavier and a female, at least a, a male Nyala, about a hundred kilograms. So he is at least two to three times bigger than both the other species. He's not related to an Impala at all. Uh, he is related closely, is the same genus as a Nyala, but much, much bigger. He's got spiraled horns. They've both got spiraled horns, or all three of them have got spiraled horns, but this chap will have eventually three or four twists to his horns, where the Nyala will only have one, and the, the Impala also only one. They're all ruminants, though, which means that they are closely related. They are antelope, obviously. They have similar feeding strategies, slightly different. I see that Siri on my telephone has decided that it wants to answer a question. Oh, she says, hey, Siri... Light and there are intellect of Oh, thank you. It looks like you haven't set up any home kit accessories. You can connect smart devices, light lights, locks and thermostats in the home map. Thank you. Okay, that's very odd. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> Let's go back there. Uh, right, then the other thing to tell you is that the Impala, of course, are what we call living fossils. Now, yesterday I was asked how old they are, how long has it been since they have evolved. And in actual fact, we have, I think there is a number for that. And I'm just going to look it up for you so that I may tell you, because it is quite astounding. And the best thing to compare it with, of course, is human beings because we know that we as a species have been around, well, depending on who you believe and what you read, let's call it uh, roughly 200,000 years. But Impala, I must search Impala. Uh, we'll just go to the section on the evolution of the Impala. Etymology, taxonomy, description, ecology, behavior. No... No, no. I have seen this, everybody. I promise I have. I know where it is. Oh, here we go. Uh, and I remember it because it's a study by a woman by the name of VRBA. I don't know how you say that. Vrba. Vrba. And she worked out that the Impala is... Come on, where's the number? Five million years. Isn't that interesting? Five million years. So 200,000 for human beings, as we are, so that's 25 times longer than we've been around. And I'll just quickly continue to read for you this. Diverged at least 18 times into various morphological dif morphologically different forms. So the common ancestor of the Impala, the Hartebeest, and the Wildebeest diverged from their current, from well, the common ancestor of all of them, diverged probably about five million years ago and has diverged, diverged again 18 times to produce the wildebeest and the hartebeest, whereas the impala has remained utterly unchanged. So that's really interesting. They're much, much older than any of these spiral horned antelopes. Pierskinating. Colbert, you're not a very funny person at all, obviously. You don't have a sense of humor. You said that is older than James. Fine, let's move on. David is even older than me, can you believe it? He's older than the Great Pyramid of Cheops. <laughs> Breezy, you want to go and find the goslings. You know what? I don't have any better ideas, so let's go and find the goslings. I think it's a very good idea. We'll go this way and see if we can find the goslings. Ah, now, Stivovo has not had enough Hosanna time for the day, so he is still trying to find Hosanna. Let's go and find out how that's going. Yes, 
Well, you can probably tell by the fact that Sebastian is looking at the roof with the camera that we are indeed underneath the rooftop at the moment. And uh, we lost, obviously, had to leave Osana. We kept to the, one of the other vehicles with him. But he, uh, he couldn't keep up. He had to cross a drainage depression. And I'm guessing it's somewhere here. So we've just taken our chance to come around and see if we can spot him. Maybe listen for some alarm calls. Nothing at the moment, so we're going to keep plodding along. And maybe we will be lucky. And if not, well, we will continue on our merry way. And obviously, we put the roof on and the rain stopped. That is the way it works. It wasn't really raining very hard, but that starts to seep, you know, and you've got a, we've got a lot of expensive equipment on here, so it's important to keep it all covered. Very out of season rain we just had. But no doubt the rain will bring some more insects. More wild flowers, perhaps some of the annuals, if we get enough rain anyway, some of the annuals will re-flower again, re-fruit and get their, their seeds going again. Kitty cat, most certainly we get rock pythons here. Most certainly. Um, I haven't seen one in some time. But definitely, rock pythons all over South Africa, I do believe. So we're hoping we could be lucky with him just popping out. And that is a snack that someone like Hosanna would probably have a go at. Python. Yep, this is the way it works out here. We can have a few very lucky moments and find him very easily. And now back to the hard element of trying to find a male leopard in this long, thick grass. And this is just absolute chance now. Hope he's going to just pop out here somewhere. Hello little prince. Where are you this morning? Well, while we carry on with our search, I believe Brentlio Smith is out of the rain where he likes to be. He's in the tent. Hello, welcome to the tent. Now I'm busy spying. Here we have James. Doop. You can see where he's moving. That's Rusty, the R. And then the J is Steve. Now, we found Tundi about where my mouse is there on foot this morning. And I'm not sure where James left her. But she was moving through some difficult areas. Now, I've already, I've already found something in the tent to look at under the microscope. And it is dung. <gasps> and it's dung I found inside the tent, so I didn't bring it from outside of the tent. So I'm going to ask you, can you guess what animal made this little dropping so hashtag safari live if you think you can figure out what it is i'm not going to break it open just yet but what we can do is have a look at the size of it oopsie my finger in the way there there we go so you can see it's quite small and my hands are still dirty from helping james get unstuck <laughs> so there we go tiny little dropping i wonder if anyone can figure out what that is and then uh once we've had some guesses i'll try to open it up oh there we go let's actually let's go back to the microscope again i've just popped it on the other side so you can start seeing and maybe trying to figure out what bits are inside this poop ah a very good good guess from carol with dwarf mongoose however it is not a dwarf mongoose carol um it is even smaller Sid, you are 100% correct. It is indeed a gecko. And so a gecko that's been living inside the, 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 the tent and taking advantage of any insects around there. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to break it up quickly to see if we can actually see 
Um, that looked like a bit of a thorax, that big round thing. So I just want to break it up to see if we can see any pieces of of um, what it might have been eating. Probably quite a lot of moths. Um, sometimes you can actually see... Oh, I'm trying to get it into the right spot. I'm going to try and change the focus there a bit. Ah! Now, you can start seeing little bits of different creatures. So I'm just going to try and see where this comes in. So there, that looks like the head and uh, uh, thorax of a moth uh, in there. But there's also, I saw an ant leg somewhere. I can't spot it now. Um, also the odd termite head um, in there. The, there we go. You can see some of the orange looks like termites. So this gecko has been having a great time here in the tent with lots to eat and without and having a nice safe place to live as well. So very interesting. So I actually just noticed that the, the gecko dung up on the shelf when I was thinking, what on earth am I going to talk about? And then I saw the gecko dung and I was like, of course, gecko dung. What else? Okay, now we're going to go back across to James, who we're going to spy on as he makes his way to see if the goslings are back at Buffalo's Hook Dam. Well, we have some brief signal, everybody, but I don't think it's going to last. We're on our way to the goslings. We're not far from there. Liam, you said how long? You said 15 minutes. I said 10. I don't think we're more than five minutes away now, Liam. Okay, we're five minutes in. I think I'm correct. Haven't seen anything else since we left there, I'm afraid. Now, I know that you've heard us complaining passionately about the temperature at various stages, Shelley, but it actually doesn't get very cold here at all by the standards of most of the rest of the Earth. It probably drops to around about 10 or 9 degrees Celsius on the really cold mornings. I have experienced one morning of 4 degrees Celsius, which is about 45 or 40 degree, 42 degrees Fahrenheit or so. Uh, but that's the coldest it gets. And then in the middle of the day in winter, it will almost always go above 20. So around about, uh, what is 20 degrees, it will go to 75 quite re regularly during the winter in the middle of the day so winter is not very unpleasant it is chilly when you drive around in the middle of the morning on an open Land Rover at least at dawn but other than that it's really not too bad I say okay, signal is dropping and Steve is refreshing himself Yes, well, we are trying to find this beautiful young leopard, and he might have given us the slip, but I thought I would just give it one more effort, go down the road. I'll just show you on the map where we had him. So, we started off this morning with him over here. He walked across here, and he's gone down into this drainage. That's where he was lost. You see the little blue lines as the drainage depression, and then he kind of crossed they headed in this sort of direction. So we are on this road, hoping he's going to pop out. He might have just gone back into the drainage and back up to quarantine. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to go down here one more time, go back up again, give quarantine one more look, because that's where all the Impala were earlier. So maybe he hasn't given up hope on the confused, rutting antelope. And then from there on, who knows? Jump on board, get yourself a coffee, make yourselves comfortable. Anna-Marie, um, a boomslang is not really aggressive. I mean, it's not going out to bite anything. And uh, potentially, because leopards are in trees, boomslangs are in trees, they might encounter each other. But the boomslang is looking for chameleons and looking for lizards and geckos and things like that. And it would probably avoid a leopard. Um, and, you know, if it bit a leopard, uh, it's a good chance the leopard could die, for sure. But I think maybe the leopard learns to avoid them. I'm not sure. I've never seen a, a leopard encounter a venomous snake before. Maybe they know. Instinctively, they know that something is off about that. I've seen some funny things on 
on the World Wide Web of people putting cucumbers next to their cat. And when the cat sees the cucumber and absolutely freaks out, maybe it's cruel to do that, but the reaction is priceless. So maybe it's just because an object materialized there that wasn't there before, or maybe it's because they have an instinct of fear of long green snake-like objects. It's hard to say, but I've never seen a leopard encounter a black mamba or a boomslang or anything like that. I have seen them killing um, pythons before, but that is a different snake altogether. So they're not afraid of a python, so maybe they won't be afraid of a, of a boomslang because they're very fast. Leopards can maneuver around and grab behind. I mean, honey badger's not scared of snakes. They, they quite like snakes, it seems, having quite an immunity to the venom. Okay, so we can't really pan down there, but the drainage depression is just down there, and we're going to do a little loop around that side. It looks like Brent is looking at something really, really close. Let's go see what it is. Yes, indeed, I am. I, I went for a little walk in the in the grass, and uh, I've really enjoyed having a closer look around flowers because I found incredible ecosystems and animals living on a tiny little flower. And I've done the same today. Last time it was earwigs with uh, the Walfaria. Today I went and picked up a little yellow felt justicia, and we found a perfectly colored little spider if you live on a yellow flower um, I'll show you what the flower looks like a little bit later because he's climbed out of the flower I will put him back but I'm not sure what spider this is um, but isn't that absolutely beautiful and you can see all four of his legs and big or her legs a big fat abdomen and uh, they hide in amongst the, the, the flowers. And a lot of these spider species and stuff like that will be specific to a type of plant, of course, because their camouflage will rely on that. So I was actually looking for little yellow crab spiders when I found this little fatty. I'm not sure what type of fat spider it is. Um, maybe one of the pea spiders? I'm not sure. But it is... It is very cool. And yes, Ravinda, indeed, the eyes are tiny. And you can see the multiple eyes of a spider. So you can see there's, you can see one, two, three, four, five, six, two, four, six, six, six eyes. And you can see it's just moving slightly there. Now, as I said, I found it hiding on a little yellow justicia flower. Now, of course, there are perfect little ambush spiders, these types of spiders. They don't make big webs they'll spin very fine little bits of silk all around the spy uh, all around the flower and then any insect that's coming to try and feed off the 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 nectar um will actually then get caught in that fine silk and then they'll come out of hiding sometimes they'll even some species not this the crab spider which has got far more developed front legs will hide in the flower and as an insect comes in the flower uh, it'll grab it but these spiders uh, will rely on a very very fine intricate network of silk uh, across the 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 flower itself and around the flower so there we go that is the little yellow felt justicia so there we go tiny little flower i'm gonna get dave to show you how small the spider is i mean look at that there he is there how tiny he is little little chap oh if we can go back to the microscope we can see him moving a little bit there we go you can see she's actually had to spin around it's probably going to start trying to move back towards um, where it can hide now uh, Tim it's not a jumping spider uh, that abdomen is too big and too heavy for the let me see if I do that does that make a difference there we go you can see a bit more color if I block off the light a little bit and so yes Tim it's not sorry it's not a jumping spider a jumping spider would have far more developed black legs 
uh, back legs, bigger back legs, uh, that you can use it to leapfrog. Okay, isn't that so cool? It's it's always amazes me when you start looking very, very, very carefully um, at these things uh, that you see all sorts of wonderful little creatures. Now, I'm going to put the spider back outside. And while I do that, I'm going to just show you. And you can see when I put... I'm trying to just see if I can find the little... I can't really see them on this, but I'm just trying to see. I might, unfortunately, there might not be too many of them around. They're so fine, we can't see. But there we are. You can even see that the, the leaves have those tiny little hairs, um, hairs on them. And you can see there's a few little droplets of water. So those tiny little things are little droplets of, of, of water from the rain that we've just had that are sticking to the hairs. So quite a few plants will not only get their water from their root system, uh, they'll be able to take in water from from the rain uh, and through through their leaves. This is amazing. Now, when I look at a microscope like this, I always look carefully because you never know if there's not another little critter hiding somewhere on one of these flowers. But very, very cool. Indeed, YouTube viewer, nature is truly amazing. Now, let's go take, oh no, not that one, let's take this little one back outside. Now, I've taken my shoes off uh, so I don't tramp sand all through the tent. David didn't listen. So, that is also true. I just thought you would think. So, I'm going to put it back on the little yellow justicia where I found him. Here we go, back onto the same little flower that I found him from. And while we see what other wonderful little things we can find, let's send you back to Steve, who's still looking for her son. Yes, we are. We are, have come back onto the big open area of quarantine. And the other side of that sort of drainage, we're hoping that um, the little chief will materialize again. Marvelous if we did find him again but i think it'll be a absolute sign of luck if we do but we're feeling lucky aren't we seb yeah. we're feeling lucky but very hard to to just bump him he might have come back towards the road that's what we're kind of hoping for or maybe he's lying down close to the road Maybe he's in a tree, maybe he's eating an impala. For all we know, he could be doing any of the above. Well, it seems like we have a new member on the staff this morning, and let's go and see how he shows himself on camera. Hello everyone, and my name is David. And I'm very excited to be here with my trainer, James Henry. I come from Kenya, and Kenya is a country in East Africa. We may be showing you where Kenya is much later, but we are talking of 1,800 miles from where we are now. For those who did metric in school like me, give or take 2,800 kilometers. From where we are and we got some goslings that we're just watching a few seconds ago and very interesting uh, when I heard James the other day as he has been training me all the way from Kenya and he still think I'm doing good and that's why he brought me here that uh, the Egyptian geese are not very good mothers or not very good parents but from what I've gathered since I was in Kenya, these goslings have been seven and they are still seven. I might want to correct James. Oh, sorry, my apologies. My apologies have been corrected. Uh, they started with eight. What might have, have happened to one? We don't know. N nobody knows. But I think seven out of eight is a very good job done by the parents of are uh, these goslings, the Egyptian geese there. I would guess that could be the mother. I do not know where the father would be because mostly they are very monogamous and they will stay together taking care of the goslings. And being vegetarians, I would guess they would be eating some seeds from the grass 
and yep so that could be the other pair well done vm and i'm not sure how to tell the male from the female they don't have a very clear sexual dimorphism it could be wrong there but i think they are doing a very good job on this dam here that once in a while james says it looks like the cow pea soup i see a lot of algae there and that what could be giving this water that kind of color and earlier there was a hippopotamus which is very unusual to see them in this kind of water i do not know where the hippopotamus went vm all right vm says scuba diving and just taking rather long underwater there without breathing which yeah it should be up by now to have a little oxygen In the background there you can hear all the doves out there Egyptian geese are all over Africa and Christy you'd like to know whether we got Egyptian geese in the Mara I think we have more Egyptian geese in the Mara than we have here in Juma I might be corrected later on by James but I think we have more yes 100% we got more there and the hippo just popped up there maybe also to help me confirm my answer that yes with that nice eye wink that we got Egyptian geese in the Mara strange just to see him or her alone here I do not know where the others could be the temperatures are quite down and once in a while we'll see hippos coming out of the water when it's cool like this to look for some grass these are some of the beasts you don't want to meet out in the water when you're just walking and they've done a lot of damage to many people here in Africa especially when you come between them and the water you should be very very careful as much as you can be away from the water you've got a better chance of survival it's blowing out some water from its nostrils there vm where did the ghostlies go and as you try to find out where the ghostlings have gone i think steve got a tall animal We do, we have not found our spotted friend Hosanna, but we have found three in front of us and one off to the left, big giraffe. Fantastic. And they are not showing any sign of spotting a leopard or a lion. They are looking at us and looking at the meat-eating Sebastian in the back seat. Now what are they looking at? Clearly looking at something over the tall grass. probably be just an antelope moving but giraffe can be very reliable indicators as I've said many times before of something moving in the long grass it just got such a nice vantage point of it all but he the female at the back is more interested in whatever's moving maybe she's looking at another male there seem to be a few males here competing for her attentions Wisteria, they are very tall animals. Very, very tall. And there you can see the male. The ossicones on top of the head are quite large, quite thick. Not fully mature, that one, though. Still could do with a bit more calcifications on the head. A bit more weight into the hammer. They use the head for their fighting, obviously. They don't go through a rutting season like the Impala do. What is they looking at? Another female looking behind me here. I'm just going to turn the vehicle quickly and see if I can spot whatever it is that they're looking at. Ashlyn, I have no idea. I've never heard I've never heard that before. Ashlyn says is it true? Giraffes can't yawn. I don't know. Very interesting. I've never seen them open their mouth very wide like that so I couldn't tell you to be honest but if you've heard that before well then possible wonder who spent days and days and days with the giraffe and watch it 
see if it yawns. I mean, have you ever seen antelope yawning, to be honest? I see leopards and lions yawning. Have you seen an impala yawn? I've never, not something I've ever focused on, or paid attention to. But uh, there is the male, the bigger of the two males. He's also quite dark, a little bit more sort of weight on his head. His ossicone's a little bit bigger. He's having a little bit of a cleaning session there with the ox picker on his head. Eyelashes that would make any lady envious. Eloise, no. Giraffe don't charge people, but then again, I mean, I mentioned it earlier on in the show that um, a female was killed by a giraffe a few years ago. I'm not sure what she was doing or why she was as close as she was to a giraffe, but it kicked her. And, um, yeah, a big boot, big size 20. If that hits you anywhere, it could lead to some serious bodily harm with the 1,500 kilogram animal behind it. So, no, they're not known for charging. They generally move off. They're quite docile, peaceful animals. But, obviously, if you get within their sort of comfort zone and they need to lash out with a very powerful kick, um, it would not do you a very good deal, an amount of, of happiness to your body, I am sure. Now you can see she's busy chewing the cud. You see the ossicones are much smaller than the males. And whatever it is they were looking off to in the distance is not there anymore, not catching their attention anymore. Shelley, I've never heard giraffe alarming. They're regarded, or a lot of people would say that they're mute. I've never heard them snort or whatever, but when they do get caught or something's jumping on them, I have heard them make some ghastly sounds, bellows and all that sort of thing, but I've never heard a giraffe snort or alarm in any sort of way. I wonder if maybe Brent or James has. If anyone has, it's probably Brent, but I am not sure if they do. As I said, they've been regarded as being mute, but they do make sounds from time to time. But generally the alarm sort of system towards a predator is to just look very intently at it. And when you get three or four giraffes all looking very intently in one direction, you could be pretty sure that something's going on. Okay, well let's go to Brent himself and find out what his thoughts are on the matter. Well, hello. No, Steve is 100% correct. I've only ever heard giraffe make noises uh, when there are lions attached to them or when we've been doing game capture. And again, not very loud noises. When they do tend to see a predator, they stare at it and occasionally actually walk closer to it while sort of looking down into the grass at it. Now, uh, I have gone out into the wet grass again to see what I could find, and I have found us another lovely little flower. And uh, it is called a Hermania glandifolia. And it is called a pink bell. Now, the interesting thing about this is you very seldom ever get to see how pretty the Hermania is because of the way it sits. And it's called a bell because it hangs like a bell. So those colors and whatnot are almost always hidden so when 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 the flower is not being plucked off of the stem and it is facing down so you know, actually hang downwards and you can see that very more well, it's very specific for certain types of insects to be able to uh, get at the, the nectar and the pollen that's there and obviously by facing down their only focus is on certain types of insects now the insect i've seen the most on the pink bell is the small blue butterfly species um, and they are quite tiny flowers it's a very small flower so quite difficult for anything bigger uh, wisteria says it reminds Mine's over Liliwa wisteria. Once we have a look at it when it's not at the microscope, you'll see how absolutely tiny it is. I mean, and that's how it sits off the tree. I uh, apologize, my nails and hands are very dirty from when we had to help James get out of the dirt earlier today when he was stuck. So you can see there, that's how it sits on on on, on the little stem. Um, but yeah, very, very tiny. And uh, I don't think I've ever seen a lily that small. 
but still a very cool little thing the Hemania or the pink bell now what I've actually been secretly hoping is that while Steve bumbles around for Hasana Hasana comes to visit the tent and it's always a strong possibility we I'm trying to think have I had Hasana in the tent before no I've had Karula from the tent I think just Karula Yeah, I think I've only had Karula from the tent, but hopefully that will change before the end of today. In the meantime, let us send you back to David, who's exploring a whole new world from Kenya. I'll tell you what, the most interesting, interesting thing is how I first got here in South Africa. To start with, I had an issue by getting my visa and I do not know what was happening but finally I got it and the same documentation I presented to the High Commission they asked me to present it two times I did not understand and I did that and I got my visa and that one night I did not sleep I was very happy and very excited it's a trip we've been arranging for quite some time and the flight the company was or the flight the company got for me to come here was Ethiopian Airlines. So before getting here, I did three countries. You imagine, Africa is a huge continent, and I was in Kenya, left Kenya, flew to Addis Ababa in Ethiopia, same day. And later on that night, I had my dinner in South Africa. Would you believe that? So happy, so excited. And one interesting thing I've seen that's different that we do not do in Kenya are the bushwalks. I've been out in the bushwalk with James a few times. Very exciting, very different. And it's outstanding how they can tell the footprints of male leopards from female leopards. This morning, as you saw earlier, to see Talamba, you know, with the mother there, was exciting. And they would tell the difference between one leopard from another by using the spots here. That's interesting. And there's two, two guests who said they think Talamba has five five. I do not know what they're talking about. I got another one month to learn that. I can't tell the spots even from an adult to live alone that cub. I'm looking forward to learn that too pretty soon. Very good. Jared, I've been a guide for about 20 years and I think I'm feeling like I'm just beginning anew. Is that not exciting? Most of my guiding have been in East Africa, Kenya, Uganda and Rwanda and this is my first time I'm doing it in South Africa. Hope that helps answer your question, Jared. I'm very happy and I can hear you, sorry, I can see you applauding wherever you are. Thank you very much. I said, still continue with my excitement, Steve is linked with Hosanna. Yes, we are, and David, welcome to the team. He is a marvelous gentleman. And I'm sure he is going to delight us all with some in, in cra crazy stories of his 20 years in the wilderness. We have just we come around again, we're listening. Any alarm calls, any sort of giveaway signs that the animals might give us because obviously with five minutes left to go of the show, it would be marvelous to get a last minute glimpse at Hosanna. But I think he is probably lying down on a termite mound somewhere in there. So as it stands, he has eluded us. That's okay. He gave us a marvelous show this morning. If only those impala had just inched a little bit closer. And um, we find it quite amazing how far away those monkeys were when they spotted him. He just 
poked his head around the termite mound and the monkeys started going and immediately what did he do? He walks in the opposite direction. Because as I was discussing with Seb, these predators, these stealthy predators, once their camouflage is gone, the elements of surprise is gone, they move off in search of, of other pickings. There we go, Seb, can you get the grey hornbill for us there? Directly in front we've got the African grey hornbill. There we go. He is a beautiful bird and I'm sure he is going to be enjoying this little rainfall that we've had because potentially just this little sp splattering of rain on the ground might be enough to key some termites out to do their thing. There's another bird just landed behind him. Ooh, it's a helmet shrike. How marvelous is that? So it would not be an activity or a morning game drive with me without doing a spot of birding. Oh, what's he doing? Is he regurgitating something there? There we go. Out of frame. Fantastic. Well, it has been a marvelous morning from all of us here in Druma in the Sabi Sands. The two millimeters of rain that have fallen have just just moistened the ground and just got us with the roofs on but all is good we are safe we are dry and it's marvelous to have David on the team and conducting his game drives at the moment and finding Tundi and Asana in the morning has been a marvelous show to the day and from FC from all the gentlemen on cam ops and myself James Brent in the tent staying nice and dry thank you for your questions and comments we'll see you again live this afternoon half an hour earlier have a beautiful beautiful day